Bonjour. C'est un grand honneur de, parler, euh, de vous parler enfin, euh, aujourd'hui, mais euh, parce que je commençais à parler en français euh, il y a un euh, an. <rire> c est, c est, euh, c il a, mais donc, il est nécessaire de euh, euh, commencer à euh, euh, parler en, en anglais pour la, 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 la talk. Donc, je m'excuse. I have to switch to English. My French is still too, uh, too slow, for, for, especially for Paris. Um, I have tried to put my slides into, uh, into French so the titles will help if, if the English is not clear. So what I want to talk about is the use of neurotechnology uh, in, in uh, treating brain disorders. And here, uh, imp importantly, I, I outline all of the techniques, many of which you've heard about uh, just in the past few minutes, of treating brain disorders. But there's the, a new area is emerging very rapidly. In fact, it's been around for a bit of time, but it is now maturing in which you are going to see technological applications to treating, to, to therapy for uh, brain disorders, for diagnostics, which have been around the longest time, but also to replace lost functions, that is to actually make new parts of the nervous system uh, with technology. And I put this picture up uh, on the, on the uh, here, uh, many of you may not recognize what that is, but I think uh, cardiac medicine has seen the same evolution in technology that we will see with neurotechnology. That's a 1950s version of a cardiac pacemaker. And you can see that it's undergone a lot of transformation uh, going to an implantable device from this sort of large uh, outside device. So the neurotechnology that is developing is coming in basically two types, although they're also becoming integrated. Those that stimulate the brain or right into the brain uh, and they're being used to replicate lost sensory functions and, and to recreate sensation, and also for therapy, and I'll talk about uh, neuromodulation in a few minutes. The other type of uh, technology that's being developed is to sense or to read out the brain for evaluation, diagnostics, uh, for, for therapy, uh, and uh, importantly, to restore movement, to work that I've been involved in. And I'm going to give you examples of both of these uh, and show you uh, where we are in the field in, in developing this technology. So perhaps the biggest success story in neurotechnology is one that's been around uh, for uh, now about 20 years. And uh, you can't see the number there, it's cut off, but about 200,000 have been implanted. And the idea of a cochlear implant is that uh, ordinarily sound is transduced in the air, physically brought into the cochlea, the escargot, the, and uh, it, it, uh, the sounds are picked up by hair cells which transduce that activity, transduce the sound, and deliver it to uh, nerve fibers, which take it into the nervous system. And in most forms of uh, hearing loss, the hair cells degenerate. The nerves are still there, the connections to the brain are still there, but the cells die. And so the uh, uh, attempt has been is to place a, a, a lead that has typically 22 uh, electrical stimulation spots and to, to thread that into the cochlea and stimulate the nerves uh, bypassing the dead hair cells. And uh, remarkably, this has been uh, a, a very successful. And what's really surprising is, is that right now you're hearing me with about 3,500 hair cells on either side. And uh, this is replaced by about 22 of the cochlear implant. Now, this is also an example, as uh, Professor Ajid mentioned earlier, of plasticity. Because when you first turn on the cochlear implant, I'll play you a, uh, a sound of what uh, we think it sounds like at first to a person when they hear a sentence uh, said, uh, uh, using a cochlear implant. So it sounds like my French. It's uninterpretable. So, so she's they, drinking from her own cup. So later, after, uh, and it says uh, she's, he's drinking from his own cup, later a person learns to understand that pattern of activity. And so what we believe is happening is, is that the combination of this new input to the brain plus brain plasticity has allowed a person to interpret these signals in the world. It's really a miraculous uh, invention and it's helping large numbers of children. I've learned recently that over 90% of children that need them in Switzerland get them. So it's really quite a remarkable uh, device. Another, another form of degenerative disease that's benefiting from technology that stimulates uh, is in vision. Uh, the, one of the more common types of visual loss is macular degeneration in which the central portion of the eye is uh, in, uh, rendered uh, uh, in, invisible so you can't see. Uh, this is again due to the degeneration of the cells uh, that receive the photoreceptors that receive the light. But the pathway from the brain, from the eye, sorry, from the eye back into the brain in the visual areas remains intact. 
So the strategy has been to put electrical stimulation, a plate of electrodes, so here you can actually see the electrode, there are little dots, which are stimulation sites, placed on the back of the retina. And uh, through an image provided by a video camera, uh, electrically stimulate the fibers that go back to the eye and, and back to the brain and deliver that information to the brain. Now, so here's just a video from one of two, two or now three companies uh, uh, that, are, that are producing these devices. And what you can see is just to give you a sense of there's electrical stimulation coming back to the back of the eye, and this is going through the visual pathway. So something like this doorway would give rise to a pattern of activation, but it's really a kind of crude activation uh, of just a, a series of spots. And we do have an idea of what this looks like, uh, how you can take a pattern of dots and turn them into an image. And if you look on the left, and it's particularly hard to see here, but can, I don't know if you can see, but even with this little bit of an image, you can see that it looks like you can tell that there's a hand. So this is what we imagine that, that people are seeing. Uh, this is what they report. But this can be useful vision if you look at a person uh, with this one, one technology here. He's asked to point to the spoon on the table. And of course, you know, this is uh, easy for us. It takes a few seconds of, of, of seeing what's going on. It's a very bright table. Yet nevertheless, he can point to the spoon. So we've begun to be able to restore vision by electrical stimulation. Now another way, in addition to sensation, to uh, uh, affect the nervous system is to use electrical stimulation to influence circuit behavior. And, and you heard a little bit about this earlier. Uh, so if you, if you look at an anatomical picture of the brain, uh, what you, could, it, but you can't appreciate all the wiring. Uh, there are new techniques that are being developed that even in the intact human brain, we can begin to appreciate the complexity of the circuits that, that are there. These colored uh, lines are all wiring uh, for various circuits in the brain. And in fact, uh, one of the most dramatic applications of stimulating a brain circuit has come from this technique called deep brain stimulation. Uh, and it's uh, been applied in Parkinson's disease. And the person who has made the greatest contribution, the original contribution, was Ben Benabid, uh, who is French. So you have, uh, and, and this won the Lasker Prize just last year for, uh, for this advance. So what does this do? Uh, so here is a person that has Parkinson's disease. You heard about it. It's, it's a loss of dopamine, the, the dopamine in the brain. And these people are bradykinetic. Uh, that is, they're slow moving, and they uh, have a, a, a rest tremor. And you can see that uh, they have a very uh, difficult time walking. And now, if we were to insert stimulating electrodes into a small structure that's part of the basal ganglia circuitry uh, and stimulate on both sides, we have a rather remarkable effect. Uh, this person uh, is almost immediately able to overcome all of the d uh, dysfunction of, of Parkinson's, and you can see she's walking quite well. Uh, her tremor is gone. And what most people don't recognize is that this is an implanted device, uh, and uh, it has uh, uh, been done. Uh, more than 100,000 people have this kind of implantation. This does not cure the disease, but it uh, somehow, and, it, and still in a somewhat mysterious way, overcomes the disability of the circuit. It reorganizes the brain circuit so that uh, it overcomes the disability uh, and, and allows a person to, uh, to function normally. Uh, this kind of technology is being applied in many other cases, people are trying, where else can we stimulate and influence circuits? One of the more striking ones in children is the, uh, in uh, dystonia, which has uh, muscle rigidity. And you can see a child here with a particular genetic type of, of dystonia. Her limbs are twisted. Uh, she has high muscle tone, so she can't move out of this position. And uh, stimulating in a different circuit, uh, you can see an extraordinarily, this is this young woman with the stimulators placed in her brain in a different target and the globus pallidus, and, and really she's overcome the dystonia. So it's had a remarkable impact. So the, the same approach is being tried in psychiatric disorders. And I think now the question is, what circuit should we actually stimulate? But uh, there are applications in obsessive compulsive disorder, which I believe this is the correct French uh, uh, translation for obsessive disorders, uh, for depression, and for dementia. These are in early stages of trials, but the idea, again, is to, is to restore the circuit to some form of normal function. Uh, so there's a great application of brain stimulation in, in circuitry. Now, the other, the other type of uh, uh, brain interfaces that are being developed, neurotechnologies, are those that read out. This is work that I've been in, involved in uh, for, for many years now. And the idea is to read out signals uh, to develop commands to reestablish movement. 
So I'll show you a case of a patient. This is uh, uh, Mr. Nagel, Matt Nagel. He's a 25-year-old. He's playing a video game. He has to hit these targets and avoid these squares. And you can see for a 25-year-old playing a video game, he's not very good. But the problem is, is uh, uh, Matt has had a spinal cord injury. He's had a cervical spinal cord transection due to a knife wound. So he's unable to move his arms and his legs at all. And we have put uh, a sensor in the motor area of his brain, and it's reading out his thoughts to move. So he's not controlling that with a joystick or a computer mouse, but using his brain signals that we're decoding and sending uh, into the computer so he can play that video game. So that kind of device is called the brain-computer interface. Uh, the one that I work on is called BrainGate. And it is attempting to reconnect the brain to the body when that connection has been lost. So uh, just to remind everyone, paralysis is very often, it's, it's, it's a, a consequence of a number of diseases. They've been cut off here, but the spinal cord injury, stroke, traumatic brain injury, are all uh, causes of, of uh, paralysis. <clears throat> and basically what can happen is uh, <clears throat> the, the pathway between the motor cortex and the spinal cord can be cut. Uh, a brainstem stroke is one of the most devastating types because it disconnects the brain from the entire body and, and typically speech is lost. Uh, also disconnection of the spinal cord uh, to the muscles, either due to uh, motor neuron disease or even limb loss, leaves a person with a brain that is functioning, able to think about movement, but unable to move. So the idea with these brain-computer interfaces and BrainGate, the one I've been working on, <laughs> sorry, the, the, um, the idea is to take a tiny array of electrodes. You can see here it's four by four millimeters. It has 100 hair-thin electrodes. Those are placed in the motor area of the, of the uh, cortex, the area where we know from about 100 years of work that there's an arm representation. Uh, currently, there's a plug on the head. The signals are taken out. And you can see what looks like a mess of signals here. There's 100. Each one of these little uh, uh, boxes is an electrical impulse coming out of these electrodes. Uh, here's just one of them, so you can see it. You'll hear more about a neuron in a second. They're, they're taken out. And then these signals are processed through uh, amplifiers and computers, and basically when it's decoded properly, uh, it can result in the person's thought becoming an action. So let me first show you that, in fact, it is convincing that the brain of a person who's been paralyzed, in this case a person who was paralyzed for 10 years, actually does have activity. So you're going to listen to one neuron. You'll hear the clicking noise of its action potentials. And this is the, the thought of a human uh, being told, imagine relaxing your hand, Imagine uh, closing your hand or imagine opening your hand and you can listen to the activity or you can see this little pink uh, little line uh, increase or decrease in frequency just to give you a sense that we can actually read out these brain signals. So I'll have to adjust the volume if it gets too loud. Relax. Now imagine you're opening your hand. Relax. Close your hand. It's silence. Relax. Open your hand. So, so this is the language of the motor cortex, the language of the brain, actually. It's speaking in the number of these pulses that you hear. And I hope you can appreciate that if you hear a lot of pulses, you could actually decode this and say, I want to open the hand. If you hear very few, I want to close the hand. And effectively, that's how we do it. I won't have time to go into the details. Uh, so with that, we, we wanted to know what could people do, and uh, we saw, you know, I showed you the, uh, the, the movie of Matt controlling the cursor. Uh, here's Matt. We asked him to try to draw a circle, and you can see that uh, he can draw a circle, but it's pretty crude. It's not uh, anything as elegant as we can do with our own hand. We asked uh, a brainstem stroke patient here to try and uh, control a wheelchair because we didn't know how well and, and, uh, she could control it. She isn't sitting in it. She's sitting over here, and her, uh, her signals are being delivered to the wheelchair so she can get kind of a crude control of the wheelchair. And then we asked uh, Matt uh, to try to control a robotic hand. So this is a hand sitting on Matt's lap, and we asked him simply open and close it by the, the decoded signals coming of his brain. And if you listen, you can hear an English expletive of his reaction to being able to move something, even though he's completely paralyzed. Close, holy shit. Open. Close, holy shit. 
So, so these are, are examples of people being able to do something, but they're really kind of useless demonstrations. Really, the important thing is to help people who are paralyzed being able to interact with their environment again. So the first attempts have been to say, let's use not their own arm, but a prosthetic limb, and see whether they can, in fact, use these brain signals to control a limb to do something simple, like take a drink. So this is our, our, uh, the idea. And uh, here is uh, Kathy, who is a person who was uh, uh, 10 years, more than 10 years, uh, locked in from a brainstem stroke, so she can't speak, she can't move. You can see the plug on her head. This goes off to computers. This is being run to, ro uh, run to this robotic arm. And uh, she, her job is using these signals to pick up her coffee in here and take a drink for the first time in, uh, in, in really in 10 years that she had done this. So ordinarily, she has to depend on some person to help her have even a drink of water. Again, you can see it's not as elegant as a hand movement. And part of that is because we don't fully understand the neuroscience of how the brain is programming movement. What's remarkable is with a few signals how well she can do. So because of time, I won't go into the, I won't uh, go through the whole movie, but just to say that she was able to put it back down on the table again after we told her she had to stop drinking uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and being able to control this. So the dream is really to do something where we repair the nervous system physically to a point where the person is doing everyday tasks and they look like anyone else. So here is, an, uh, again, a dream of a, of a device that's implanted in the brain. This one is actually communicating to a small package of electronics that decodes the signals. And here what we're doing is feeding it to a, a stimulator in the arm, this electrical stimulator, uh, is called a functional electrical stimulation device. It actually exists. Uh, it can receive signals, stimulate nerves, and move the arm. Not as well as this, but it can, in fact, move the arm. This kind of device, though, is not controlled by brain signals now, but by external switches. <clears throat> so the, the dream is to be able to uh, combine the device implanted in the head with a decoder and then be able, for a person to be able to control their own arm and be able to live independently. So this is coming, but why can't we do this now? Well, one of the problems is, is that the, the technology we have uh, consists of a plug and all this ex external electronics. We also have to have a technician in the room, so we need smarter computers, and we need computers that are rather large and they need to be miniaturized. So I'll give you just one of the advances that's, that's happening very rapidly. It's something that uh, Brown University, where I uh, formerly was a professor uh, and s still remain a professor, and uh, the V Center, where I am now, uh, working to develop technology in which we can t get rid of this plug in the head and make what we call a brain radio. And I understand in, uh, in French this kind of translates like a radio station, and, and that's how we think of it. It's a radio station from the brain uh, to the outside. The, the current device, which we hope will be available in two years, will allow direct communication and even enable this kind of control of, a, of an arm. Uh, but we're, we're now working so in the near future we'll have a device that's very tiny, uh, about the size of your thumb, and being uh, easily implanted in people with paralysis, or for other disorders as well. So this is a kind of a, a, a look at where we are in, in developing this futuristic technology. For those of you who know the TV show or the movie Star Trek, uh, this is Captain Pike, and this was their view now, uh, really, they think, a thousand years in the future. And in fact, I was surprised, you'll see, uh, how primitive this kind of decoding is. He has something that communicates his brain signals to this light in a wheelchair. Ladies, gentlemen, they wanted to visit you. Two flashes mean no. I thought you might make it. So, so this is a crude interface where he has to flash a light simply to communicate. Well, we're better than that now, so in some ways we're a thousand years into the future because we have a person controlling something much more complicated than just a simple light. On the other hand, if you uh, follow the Star Wars movies, you remember Luke lost his hand and that was completely replaced uh, with a sensate hand and we're not there yet. We have a long ways to go. We don't know when that, was, that image was supposed to have occurred. But the vision is, again, to be able to restore one's own hand or an artificial hand attached to the body and being able to connect it. So this is our, our vision for the future. Now, 
the, the future of neurotechnology, I think, is exceptionally bright. We're going to see many, many uh, applications of these kinds of disorders, both in reading and writing. And eventually, these will be, in fact, they're already being merged, so systems will read out the brain, act on it, and then treat disorders. And we'll see them in disorders like paralysis, for neurorehabilitation to help induce plasticity, for disorders like epilepsy, you're going to hear about, uh, and, uh, and psychiatric disorders like depression, uh, dementia, and pain treatment. We may also see applications of these technologies to activate nerves in the body to overcome dysfunctions like blood pressure, sexual dysfunction, inflammation, and incontinence. And there are uh, uh, papers emerging already that say that there's some promise in being able to accomplish all of these things. So I, I'm really uh, uh, excited about the addition of neurotechnology to all of the other uh, abilities we have to be able to treat nervous, dis nervous system disorders and help people uh, regain full independence. So with that, I say merci. Thank you we very have much. time for a few questions. Please. No? Yes. Oh, no. Alain, pardon. A basic question. What is the average level of electric signals produced by the, by the neurons? And the, I have no idea of... Uh, the nature of the electricity. No, the, the level. What, what is the, what is oh, the, the level? level. Oh, the, in which range are the... the microvolts. They're extremely tiny. Microvolts. Microvolts. And one of the reasons why we need to put an electrode into the brain in order to pick up the signals is each neuron emits a signal that can be detected 50 or 60 microns away, so the electrode has to be very close to the neuron. The only time that we can use uh, signals from the outside of the head is when there are global state changes. So in sleep, we can actually measure, because large numbers of neurons are changing their electrical activity together. And those signals, which are still in the microvolt range, but they're, they, with a big sensor, you can pick those up. Uh, and also during sleep stages, we can see changes in the global state of the brain. But if we really need to, uh, in, if we really want to interpret the individual signals, the only way we know so far uh, is to be able to stick, uh, uh, put electrodes into the brain and make them close to the individual neurons, which makes a huge challenge because there are hundreds of millions of neurons and we could never have hundreds of millions of electrodes in the brain, at least not practically speaking. I think. Outside of the room, there is one question. Well, you showed many uh, examples of you know, electric stimulation and you know, beautiful application. In, in research lab, there are a lot of people using light to stimulate uh, you know, neural circuits. Do you see that as a you know, plausible uh, approach or reasonable approach for the future for uh, the neurotechnology? Yeah, so, so the question is, can you use light? So the, the recent uh, developments have shown that you can uh, put uh, light-sensitive channels into neurons with a viral transfection agent. And uh, then instead of using electrical stimulation, you can shine a light at the location. And the nice thing is, is about this is theoretically, at least, you can be highly selective as to which cells, if you have the right cells infected with the right channel. Uh, so you could turn off cells or turn on cells as you want. There have already been animal demonstrations where a bl blind mouse has been able to see how well that mouse sees, we don't know, but they're able to go towards light. Uh, when they have, no longer have photoreceptors because the ganglion cells have been made light sensitive. There are, uh, I think, three or four labs or companies developing this technology now. The concern is the viral agents that we use to deliver these and whether they'll uh, be effective in humans or whether they're dangerous in humans. And so that, that's one of the big steps. And the other question is how efficient are these at uh, giving us the kind of outputs we want. So you will see these developing uh, very quickly over the next decade, I'm sure. Une autre question à droite, s'il vous plaît. Hello, John. Um, you um, emphasized the recording and signals uh, because it's a big problem and for very obvious reasons. But at a time when machines are learning to the extent that they can beat world champions at Go, do you think that there's an element of plasticity that might come into some of these machines and that actually uh, the, um, the informatics side will permit learning of... Uh, of actions and the like, given that we also know that these areas that are activated, certainly in the motor system, with thought, are exactly the same as are activated with action itself. 
Yes, so I guess the, the question is whether we can use the sort of advances in information processing. I think this, this whole field is an example of where the fundamental neuroscience is key, is essential, using our understanding of how to uh, interpret signals and how to decode them, which is a mathematical challenge, a computational challenge, and of course, uh, medicine and how to apply these signals. So yes, the, 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 the challenge here is to take a very minimalistic signal that we don't know much about and turn it into something that's a very powerful command. And clear, clearly, that's what we're doing more and more of with informatics, with computation. And that's why uh, these have to go hand in hand. That we, as I said, we'll never be able to record from every neuron. I'm convinced that's the only way we'll ever know everything going on in your brain. So we don't have to worry about that. But if we want to use a reduced sample, a tiny sample of the brain, uh, we'll need this kind of powerful um, uh, mathematical tools in addition, I think uh, advances in neuroscience, you know, uh, in, uh, you know, real dedication to understanding the principles by which the brain works will also improve that as well, and also improve computing. One question on your left. Excuse-moi, je parle français parce que je connais mieux le français que l'anglais. Je vous remercie d'avoir parlé de la plan cochléaire. C'est en effet une très belle, très belle invention qui va bientôt fêter son 40e anniversaire de la première implantation qui a été faite à Paris dans quelques mois. Mais je voudrais également vous poser, vous faire une remarque. En matière sensorielle, et surtout chez l'enfant jeune, il y a une période critique au-delà de laquelle les résultats ne sont pas bons, et c'est pour ça que maintenant on implante les jeunes enfants à partir d'un an, dès que les jeunes enfants sourds de naissance. Euh, je ne sais pas ce qui se passe au niveau des yeux, mais je pense que ça doit être un petit peu la, la même chose, car il y a une colonisation, en tout cas, du cerveau auditif par le cerveau visuel. Et c'est d'ailleurs sans doute ça qui explique la raison de l'aspect très particulier de, de la langue des signes, qui ont des gestes très brutaux qui vous passent devant les yeux. Pourquoi Parce qu'ils ont colonisé leur cerveau auditif avec leurs yeux et ils ont une aptitude à distinguer les distances que les autres enfants n'ont pas. Mais la question que je voulais vous poser, est-ce que, au niveau moteur, quand vous proposez à vos patients de réaliser les exploits que vous nous avez montrés, est-ce que les résultats sont moins bons lorsque vous avez été obligé d'attendre plusieurs années avant de leur proposer le résultat Est-ce qu'il y a là aussi une urgence, en quelque sorte, à effectuer le travail que vous faites so I need some help. It was too long. So can you give a bit of a... a, a, a bit of Somebody can summarize the question? Yes. Quick yes. In English? I can. Yes. Uh, yes. So the question was, is there a good time in order to uh, use your devices in infants, in children, or in adults? The reason is that during development, of course, the plasticity is more important than, a, than in adults. Yes, of, of course, uh, without knowing that this is uh, really functional and useful and safe in adults, we would never use it in children, so it's very difficult. But of course, we know there are critical periods in the development of the nervous system. There's plasticity in the early stages that seems to go away with adulthood. So we would imagine that, in fact, using the device earlier on and a person who had lost a limb, a child that had lost a limb, or a child that was par paralyzed, would allow much richer control. And the good example of that is the cochlear implant. And in general, if cochlear implants are implanted earlier, the children do better than if they are later on. So there is a kind of plasticity, w which was clearly demonstrated in the cochlear implant, that, that seems to go away to some extent. Another question in English. <laughs> Thanks. You, you showed us that uh, at the end of your talk that you were able to place the device at the level of the shoulder. How does it work? Do you mean that each electrode needs to be implanted in each nerve? How, how, do, you, how do you see this, um, for me, difficult problem? So one of the things that's a bit provocative to more traditional uh, people from the motor control world is that it turns out that the area of the motor cortex that controls the arm is not at all broken up into subdivisions uh, unless you use electrical stimulation. If, and I think you understand what I mean by that. But what, what it is, it's, it's actually a pattern of output. And each small zone is a very rich source of information about the entire arm. And that has now been replicated not only by my own lab, but by two other labs. 
in humans as well as in animals. So it's really an interesting change. So what's fortuitous about that is when you put 100 electrodes in amongst hundreds of thousands of neurons, there's enough information about the entire arm, the fingers, the wrist, that you can get a rough idea. And the rough idea is demonstrated by Kathy's use of that robotic arm. It's not elegant like our arm, but in fact, she's able to open and close the hand. She's able to bring the arm back and forth just as we do. So is that, I think, so, so it isn't as difficult. And we also know, as one other piece of information, since about 1870, we know there's a chunk of the brain where the arm is located. And uh, so there's been repeated verification, and it's actually anatomically visible in an MRI scan. We can find it every time. And that's the critical region where we go for this, this arm information.